Peter, today we see a lot of distrust to the uh, mainstream media by the by the public, and um, really it's something we have uh, experienced here in Ukraine. But we really see the very similar patterns uh, in the UK during Brexit, as as now we also see in the UK. You know, like when, especially when you know, like the mainstream media are considered to you know support anti-Brexit campaign. Would you share this thing that you know that the, the generally there is a lot of public which re, that, that there is this kind of uh, um, crisis? So the paradox of Brexit was the whole anti-establishment narrative, which included against establishment media, was done by parts of the establishment. So all the major newspapers were for Brexit: Daily Telegraph, The Sun, The Daily Mail. So the biggest broadsheet, the biggest middle brow newspaper, and the biggest tabloid. If anything, it was a victory for very, very classical uh, you know, communication, propaganda, whatever you want to call it. Uh, the BBC um, is considered to have not done its job very well because it didn't interrogate you know, some of the falsehoods from both sides, but it's considered more from Brexit side. So a little bit like the situation with when Russian media plants a false narrative, BBC gave equal weight to two sides. So let's say you know, an economic expert, so most economic experts were for Remain. Maybe one was for Brexit, but they had to be given equal time. So there was that. But actually, you know, Brexit ran a very innovative campaign in some ways. But no, no, there's a little bit of a trick. If anything, it was, it was a very establishment kind of like, it's the media, it's the newspapers what won it. It was a really big victory for classical newspapers. Um, why do you think we have here this, you know, normality of the false narrative which is presented by the establishment? You know, uh, because what we thought that the, the top-level politician wouldn't lie that bluntly, especially about the figures, statistic, and that's something which we also see uh, in the. Trump's campaign in the uh, Donald Trump campaign in the U.S. and also a lot of experts who just say something which is factually mm -hmm. not right, but fact checking doesn't help. So, very good fact checking organization looked at the facts for Brexit. Sure, there were some big lies. Like the, the idea, a very big campaign slogan was that we send 350 million to the EU, which is incorrect. But actually, the fact checkers found that. Most of the time, both sides were using facts. They were just taking the facts that they needed. So there's lots of reasons why we've gone from sort of information to data. Yeah? Before we had authorities, you know, there was the Office for National Statistics, and you could reference that. Now there are so many different think tanks, so many points of authority, you just pick the one that matters the most. There's so much data out there that you just pick the data that you need, and you put it into the emotional narrative that you need. Also, the amount of information out there means that there's, you can't have a core narrative anymore. And again, people then pick the narrative that they need. Social media strengthened this. Uh, Google strengthens this. So when you, have a, you Google something, you're not Googling, you're not researching. You know, Google gives you the answers based on your previous searches. So you end up sort of essentially confirming your biases over and over and over. So the very nature of information today and the fact that there's so much of it and the way that we search for it drives people into what some people call echo chambers. Um, it's pointless trying to break through an echo chamber directly with facts because the whole point is people are already, you know, they only hear what they want to hear. Um, so this is one of the paradoxes of the information revolution. Uh, we thought that it would mean more information, better research, more access to facts, better democracy. Actually, it's causing this chaos where people just choose the facts that suit them. We also mentioned, at least from here, um, that in case of Brexit, or even especially in the case of the elections in the US, you see the papers very openly taking the positions, and even the, you know, um, which is, was not so open, you know, at the same, I, I'm speaking not about the, you know, usually like the Telegraph or the Sun would take, but now you would even have the New York Times, you know, like would be very harsh on Donald Trump or really would last like he's dangerous, you know, the things like that, which you would never hear previously 
about the other presidential candidate. So, and a lot of journalists would also refer that it's a civilizational choice. It's not just exactly the issue of the political parties and the chase. Do you think that this is also the part of this um, of, of this uh, information revolution? Certainly. Look. Last time we had an information revolution was the 1930s, probably. Maybe 1950s with TV, 1930s with radio, yeah? And who does it empower first? You know, totalitarian regimes. How many books are there about Hitler? How uninteresting he was as a human being, but an incredible orator. And without the radio, that couldn't have been, there would have been no Hitler. So um, information technologies tend to not only empower Hromatsky and activists who fight against authoritarian regimes, they tend to empower demagogues and um, manipulators. And it takes a while for society to build up its defenses. So last time we had to go through a world war and the Nuremberg trials. Hopefully we won't have to do that again. You're currently here in Kiev and you know, uh, for some time, probably Ukraine and Russia had been like a bit of a playground for some of the new information technologies uh, in politics. Uh, so what is for you the interesting thing to see in, this, uh, in these countries? Not already after the, you know, the start of the Russian-Ukrainian war, but at this stage. Well, I've always said Would that... We see something what the world would be interested, what could be you know, copy-pasted and used by some other people or outside of of this region, because sometimes we are uh, picking up from somebody, sometimes we are, could be on the forefront. Are you fishing for compliments? Is this what no, you're doing? No, you're saying, no, my no, man's I, going, no, maybe you, Natalia. No, maybe we are in a place where you shouldn't be, you know, maybe it's... Okay, the, wh what, I'm speaking about Ukraine, of course. Yeah, yeah, well, look, it's fascinating. I don't, I'm not saying this is good or bad, but it's fascinating and terrifying watching what some people here refer to as, what is it, the Facebookocracy? So this, you know, it was meant to be like a good thing that ministers would start communicating with people via, via social media. I think here you've just taken it to another level. I mean, the way social media is used by, um, um, by various ministers and stuff is, is very, very interesting. Uh, I'm not quite sure what it will lead to, but it's, it's, you're definitely way ahead of the curve here. And what about the, you know, at which, you know, when we started to talk about Russia, there was this whole discussion about the ways the trolls and all the other things had been used by the regimes. You know, do you see how it's also working outside of Russia and as well? What are, besides this Facebook, Facebook course, uh, is something to watch out here? We hear here. We we have more researchers coming to ask us what's happening, especially during the time of of the conflict. Um, so so maybe what would be for the interest of the researchers on the? I think, look. I can't. Remember, this was actually around Brexit. This research, and don't quote me on the figures, but something like sixty percent of the internet is now automated. You know, these are bots, planted stories, retweeted. You know, shared. Um, I think we have to start to understand how much of these narratives online are actually being engineered. Um, and once we understand that, um, and there are data tools which can help us do that, maybe we can start um, you know, deconstructing this world. Because at the moment it just sort of generates these narratives and it's very hard to tell to what extent they're real and have real impact. Um, the most disturbing thing happening globally, and I'm, I know you have this here as well, is the use of online harassment. Um, you know, we see it in Latin America a lot, in Mexico, and I know we see it here as also well. journalists, activists being attacked by we don't know who because you can never source anything, uh, but basically being threatened and psychologically broken. How we can discuss to see, to bring this reality, the online reality and offline reality together? Because sometimes it's really hard to understand, is it really the public opinion? Are there really people supporting this campaign, this candidate, this idea? Um, I don't know, better... Um, I think we're only at the start of sort of researching you know, how data works. Um, what, I, what I don't feel comfortable with is that um, 
you know, a lot of the data from algorithms is, is not public. So the technology companies have it and the advertising companies have it and rich political parties can have it. So it's way beyond just social media. It's like, what are people looking at in Google? You know, with fashion, you know, you can usually tell if pink is going to be a big hit this season if people have been looking up pink on Google, yeah? You can just see trends developing. So the most important thing at the moment is for us, normal people, activists, journalists, to have tools with which to, you know, understand the data. Because at the moment, it's this closed world that has it. Um, and that's very, very unhealthy. I mean, there's a lot more on the internet we can find out outside of like what's trending on Twitter, which is a bit of an obvious one.